this year should be a blessing and a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Ruve and Yeshaya Ben Yisrael, Ben Yomin Wolf, Ben Tzvi Hirsch, and Borach Ben Ben Yomin Wolf. Uh, she should go for a schus and a merit for these people. I'd like to speak about, uh, again, something which I think is very important. And it's what really, in many ways, uh, what takes place in the end as we approach the Messianic era. So I want to talk about that. So the real topic is the concept of retribution, which many people don't realize <coughs> is part of the end. You know, sometimes it looks, the way we see things, that, you know, evil goes on and on and on, and nothing seems to happen to them. You know, so the question we have to ask, is there retribution in the end? You know what I'm saying? And do we get to see it? Interesting question, and so on. Or is, is retribution reserved for the other world? You know, if a guy dies and he goes to Gehenna, there's Gehenna, right? That's retribution. Or do we actually get to see retribution here, you see. So I want to introduce the concept that the, the phenomenon of retribution will happen here. And that's what I want to talk about, you see. And that behooves us to develop a certain bitochen, trust in God, that it's not that we'll never see retribution. We will see it. You know, in a certain sense, if you think about it, we're like the Jews at the Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the Red Sea. You know, they wanted to see the Egyptians dead. They, they clearly say it, you know, and there, there are reasons for that. I mean, one of the obvious reasons is, you know, the Egyptians never seem to go away. You know, it just never ends. So you get the feeling after a while that these guys will endure forever, which means that the Jews will be persecuted forever, you see? So in a certain sense, they need what's called reassurance, that actually there's an end to the slavery, you see? So that's what they wanted and so on, you know? They had to be reassured and a person wants to have that. It's called a hachlato. He wants to see that there is a true end. Uh, you know, and never, and never sit there in doubt. Well, who knows? Maybe it'll arise again. You see? So that's clearly one of their motives. Also, you have to remember one thing. <clears throat> There's a concept that, you know, people have an innate sense of right and wrong. People know when something is wrong. They may try to deny it, but deep, deep down, God, the Rebbeinu created mankind with a sense, intuitive sense of what is right and wrong, what is good and what is evil, you see. And that's very important. And not only that, but those people who are inherently good, you know, they want to see evil in and of itself terminated. It's not just that, well, will I be a slave forever, which is personal, but it's much deeper than that. People want, they feel that evil is wrong. So when they see wicked people punished, so that gives them satisfaction. Finally, I actually see that what I feel and know is evil actually is terminated, and not only terminated, but there's compensation, there's retribution. It's, like over, it's almost like living a sense of fulfillment that evil will be addressed in its right way, and that is that there will be retribution. So that's the second concept about evil and retribution. <clears throat> then there's a third element, which is really in many ways personal. Christ was very mad at what the Egyptians did to them. I mean, we're not looking here about one or two days. 
we're looking at being slaves in Egypt and Egypt you know was a country that really knew how to you know benefit from their slavery I mean you know we, don't, we can't even imagine what was it like to be a slave in Egypt right for hundreds of years you know and so on uh, so there is a personal element of revenge I want to see them punished as a, as, as a concept of revenge you know that they deserve this you know and so on you see then there's a concept which I uh, yeah, and so on that evil deserves its punishment and you want to see that is there truth and justice where evil will have its retribution and compensation because that's the right thing to do you see <clears throat> and so on you see you know what's interesting is that we know that at Kriya Samsov the Jews started singing Shira right Shira you know and of course the concept of Shira is that this was the acknowledgement of the hand of God that's really what the Shira is you know and so on you know that the Jews spontaneously the miracle is that they all sang the same words probably with the same melody right without consulting one another it's not like some songwriter came down and composed an Ozioshia it was a spontaneous reaction to looking at all the Egyptians dead so that was in many ways a ness uh, the act of Shira was a ness and so on you know but what is interesting you find that the angels also wanted to say Shira you know and the Roshim stopped them the famous statement Maisi Yodai Lehispoya Maisi Yodai these are my these are my handiworks even though they're Egyptians and they're not Jewish whatever but they, these are my creations I made them right and for somebody who makes anything there is sorrow right when he himself has to destroy his own creation ah uh, you see so the, the malochim in a certain sense so we can ask the question why did the Russian do that why didn't he silence Klai Yisrael he clearly silenced the malochim don't do this because you know there's a tremendous sadness grief that I have to destroy my creations and so on but he didn't do that to Klai Yisrael the Jewish people he allowed them to sing <coughs> you see so the question is why didn't he do that to Klai Yisrael why didn't he stop them <coughs> and the answer is because there are two different motives the motive of the Malochim okay we can contemplate but basically the motive of the Malochim right is to see the truthfulness of the destruction of evil is something to sing about you know it's like a fulfillment of what is right finally and what is wrong the destruction of what is wrong so the Bajam said so what, you, what you're singing about is the concept of evil being destroyed but there's a tremendous sadness you see and the sadness is is that uh, I'm destroying my handiwork I mean as much as they deserve it and they believe me they deserved it and so on, you know like I said for somebody to create something and then have to destroy the creation itself does bring in a phenomenon called grief sadness and what is he has to do you see so why didn't he stop Kleinsville because the motive of Kleinsville wasn't the concept of the destruction of evil it was the fact that they were no longer slaves <coughs> and by looking at the dead Egyptians right they knew that they would never be slaves so their motive wasn't the concept of evil having retribution their motive right Kleinsville was personal salvation right uh, that was their motive and that's okay you a lot of thank the Rabbanu Shalom for personal salvation you see and as a result of the personal salvation they acknowledged that 
the, the input of the Rabbani Shlom. You see, so they were singing Shira for those two reasons. One, because they had a personal salvation, right, them for themselves, and they acknowledged the fact that the Rabbani Shlom is the one who took them out and saved them. And they acknowledged the power of God in doing that. So, those, so therefore, the, a person is allowed to be ha happy that he won't be a slave. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But the Malachim had no personal motive. They were not slaves in Egypt. They were, doing, they were celebrating the fact that evil is, has a compensation, that it will be terminated. And the Malachim, that's true. But what's worse in this situation is these are my creations. And what, it's, such, it's so sad and that sadness accompanies the celebration of a concept, but apparently it, o it wins over that, you know, because in the end, it's a tragedy that there are creations of God that must be destroyed. So the Bansham said, don't do it, and so on. Anyway, <clears throat> in any case, that's what we see, the concept of evil. But it's interesting that in the end of time, which is really very important. And that's how we see it. Evil, okay, will have a retribution. Just like Yamsuf. Think about that. The first time the Jews, they were redeemed from Egypt. You see. So at the end of the redemption, there was a retribution of the Goyim, namely the Egyptians. So it says, He ne go alti eschem achris courageous. Behold, right? I will go alti eschem achris courageous. I will, right? I will redeem you in the end, which is the messianic redemption, just like the first. And that is, in many ways, a profound secret without getting into it because that's the same process. And therefore, you, the Bansham will replicate the same acts. You see? <clears throat> but that tells us also something. Because if you think about it, Kriyas Yamsuf was an attempt of the Egyptians to recapture the Jews, right? And either to destroy them or to make them slaves again. Probably both and whatever. See? So therefore that tells us that just like in the first redemption, there was an attempt by the Egyptians to recapture the Jews, to reassert themselves because the Jews were leaving Egypt and that's the end of free labor. I mean, whatever you want to call it, it was the end of their ability to dominate, right, the Jewish people for their own economic goods and so on. That this will also happen in the end. That's very important. In other words, there will be a Kriyas Yamsuf at the end. Interesting. But it doesn't have to be a Yamsuf, you see. But the concept of Yamsuf is really an ultimate and final retribution. And that will happen at the end also, you see. So that's what I, I, I really want to talk about. I mean, this is really an introduction to the whole concept of retribution at the end. You know, and, and a lot of people, I can just see a lot of the ideas where people say, well, you know, why should there be retribution? Just forgive them, turn the other cheek whatever you want to call philosophy and so on, which of course is absurd, you see, because why? Because it makes a mockery of evil, or I should say it makes a mockery of good. You laugh at it. What do you mean these people committed, or whoever, tremendous atrocities, right? So what do you mean you forgive them, you know? What does that even mean? Then you make a mockery of justice. You know, and speaking about justice, I was very disturbed by what happened last week in New York City. And it's, a, it's the world known already, you know, and that Donald Trump, and I have to make a comment, because these people who are involved in this incredible travesty of justice have no idea of what punishment awaits them and I will explain why Maybe since I'm talking about retribution at the end and so on so I want to interpret that event in that in light of those principles and so on you see I mean basically I'm not a lawyer obviously you know 
um, whatever. And uh, but obviously, I do have an understanding of law in the Talmud, Allah and so on. So I'll apply, and I, I consider myself fairly logical. So <coughs> therefore, I would you know interpret what I see. <clears throat> you know, it is unheard of what happened to Donald Trump. And I want to tell you something, it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Now what happened to him, we know, because they want to stop him at all costs. That's obviously the motive. They want to destroy him. They want to put him in jail for the rest of his life. Why? Because they are frightened about what he's going to do if he becomes president. It's very obvious. He will terminate, probably, devastate democratic, the Democratic Party. He will destroy the progressives. Right? And it's not because of revenge. I mean, I'm sure there will be some satisfaction. But the real destruction, they deserve to be destroyed. Why? Because he was elected president. As such, he has a right to initiate programs, laws, policies, whatever, right, that will help America. What they did is they made a mockery, a joke, about his whole presidency. <coughs> For what? for lies which they knew were lies and so on. So the man couldn't act as a president. He was so busy defending himself, if you think about that, you know, the Russian hoax, collusion, first impeachment, and then his, his, if I remember his discussion with uh, uh, Zelensky, whatever, this is, uh, it's, it's incredible. They impeached him twice. And the man is so busy trying to defend himself, he cannot act as president. They made a joke of America. It's not just Trump, because he's a duly elected president. And they cooked up false charges. And it now came out, right, recently, that there was a meeting in the White House, right, where they knew it was all false. And it was all paid for by Hillary, that they're gonna destroy him with this thing called the Russian collusion which of course was a hoax, because they found nothing. Meanwhile, the avlo, the injustice is, it's not only humiliating him as president, it's not only humiliating the presidency, the office of presidency, right? But they're stopping him from doing his job. So therefore the tremendous travesty is they're destroying democracy. That's why they should be terminated. For that reason alone, so imagine how much he accomplished in the four years that he was president. Imagine if he never had to deal with the progressives, the Democratic Party, if he didn't have these impeachment procedures, right? He could have Im imposed so much more help and made America so much more greater. So what they did is they did an incredible disservice to the American people. I'm not even looking at it as I say at the concept of Trump. And f since then, they're after him. I mean, this is not a prosecution, it's a persecution, obviously, as they call it, you know, Trump, uh, what do you call it, uh, it's really psychotic syndrome, and so on. Because obviously, they're incredibly afraid of what he's gonna do, whatever. So they cooked up this charge that happened in New York State, brought by the, D the, the DA, right together with this judge you know and so on you know what did he do so he evaluated he wanted a loan from i think deutsche bank whatever and if, as far as i know he evaluated his property as a security so he overvalued and that therefore they hold he tried to deceive the banks that he was taking a loan okay now what is incredible about that there are many issues. The first of all, you know, uh, so what happened? So the banks made a hundred million dollars in the interest that they collected. Not only that, Trump paid back every dime on time. Never missed the once payment, okay? You know, of the loan that he took and so on. And everybody walked off happy. In fact, the banks, as far as I know, said they'd be happy to do it again. What does that mean? That means you're talking about a, a, a supposed crime. It's civil, it's not criminal. Although I understand they want to try to make it criminal, whatever, right? There is no damage. There's no nezek. That's number one. 
So how could you be sued if there's no damage? Not only that, if there's no damage, there's no victim. So what are we looking at here, right? Not only that, the third idea is what is real estate worth, really? Nobody really knows. It all depends on demand. You know, it's like one guy said, my real estate property is worth whatever I can get from it. That's what it's worth is. It's a demand that determines the price at that time. There's no absolute value, really. It's all relative, and so on. So therefore, you know, and, and this judge said, incredibly, <coughs> right, that his Mar-a-Lago estate is worth $18 million. Everybody laughed at that. I think a guy's got 20 acres in top Florida real estate. They say that's worth close to a billion dollars or some phenomenal amount of money because it's such top. So $18 million, that shows this judge is a lunatic. He's, he's, he's into a court case that he has no business being part of. Uh, and I'm not even going to the fact that this judge already condemned Trump even before he started the judgment. So he should have recused, right? Uh, he's already biased. So how could he be a judge of this? So not only is there no damage and there's no victim, right? Really, there's no absolute price. And he demonstrated the judge that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's completely incompetent. You know, but it's not only that. Deutsche Bank, I think that's what the bank is, they're not fools. They don't rely on Trump. They do their own due diligence. You ever take out a mortgage on a house? Right? Yeah, my house is worth, uh, you know, uh, $80 million, right? So therefore, I want a mortgage. They, they laugh at you. We, want, we will estimate, and they send guys down to estimate. They do their own due diligence. So of course they did their own due diligence. So in the end, who cares what he said? Everybody knows this. So what are you talking about? You know, you can't fool the bank, uh, even if it's Trump and so on, you know? So when you look at all of this, it's absolutely incredible. There's no crime here. Yet the judge, not only did he convict him of perpetrating a crime, right? What he also said is that Trump has to pay 355 million dollars. Anybody know what kind of sum that is? Right? And that's the penalty. That is beyond belief, you know, for so many different reasons. I mean, talk about cruel, uh, uh, the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. Talk about, you know, cruel and unusual punishments, excessive fines, which that's what it says, you know. But it's not even a crime, you see. So they concocted this whole thing, and they gave a guy $355 million. And what's also incredible, as far as I know, in order for him to appeal, he has to put down $800 million to guarantee that he can pay back over $400 million because of the interest they add on to the $355 million, right? So in order to appeal it, he's got to either put up the cash, Okay, or he's got to, besides putting up uh, cash, he's got to get a bond. But for a bond, he's going to have to put up some type of uh, real estate, whatever, in order for him to get a, a, a bond that will uh, guarantee uh, the, the bail or whatever and so on, you know. That, but that's incredible. That will tie up his property. You know what is to have $800 million tied? And they say it takes several years before it gets appealed. What, what is this? You know, when you look at this crime, so to speak, you know, even if it's civil, you're looking at the height of a miscarriage of justice. That's really what you're looking at. Now, should we, should we be concerned? Yes, I'll tell you why. You know, the Russian measures what he does one of the greatest crimes that you can commit or one of the greatest, and greatest motives that you can do to get the Rabbanisham to wipe you out, right, is when you do something to society, I once mentioned this, that means that society cannot exist with what you do. That's exactly what happened at Sedaim. <coughs> Sedaim was a city, right, that was very prosperous, whatever, but they were crazy. 
they had laws that were contrary to logic they had laws that were contrary to laws you see for instance if you came and you had a you know a court case with somebody who stole money the, the thief didn't have to pay you had to pay the thief because you brought him to court to take out money if you didn't have the money he would never have stolen it therefore you are guilty i don't want to go into the absurdity and insanity of Sadoim. So the Rebbe obviously looked at them and said, wait a minute. In order for society to exist, there has to be law and order. In fact, that's one of the Sheva Mitzvahs Pnei Noach, right? You, you know, based on the way you conduct yourself, your civilization, you will destroy my civilization because civilized society cannot exist when you have this type of law. It's irrational, you see? So you're destroying my world. Well, meter can negate meter, measure for measure. You destroy my world, guess what? I will destroy your world. And he did, in whatever capacity, a volcanic activity, whatever it was. He just blew the place up to smithereens. Because that's what they did. Measure for measure, you see. And you find the same thing by the marble, you know. What they did is they deviated in such a way where God said, you're destroying my civilization. And we know, I once mentioned the Medrash, that the Xerah, the decree of, was sealed, that God would destroy the world. Why, what sealed it? Uh, what, what, what brought it to court and so on was the fact that they're all thieves. They're all stealing, everybody's breaking the law, there's no law and order, you know. But what really, so that itself will destroy society. I mean, just think about the shoplifting going on in New York and so on, you know. But anyway, so that will destroy a society. But what really will destroy society is what the Medrash says, is that when a guy wanted to marry an animal or another man, he would have to write a ksuba, which is a legal document that says we're married. So God said, are you, are you kidding, you guys? It's one thing to commit you know, homosexual acts, LGBTQs and so on, right? But you want to legalize it and make and, 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 and imprint this in your legal books? You're wiping up my society. I'm going to destroy you. Me the connected me the. You want to destroy my society? Guess what? I'm going to kill all of you. But you have to understand how serious that is because it's one thing to have somebody subject to the death penalty. We are talking about the whole planet. God altered the nature, totally. I mean, the waters were higher than the mountains. Isn't that normal, <coughs> you see? So he, the Russian committed an act that was beyond supernatural. It was just incredible. Why? Measure for measure. You want to destroy my planet, I will destroy yours. So what these people are doing, and they have no idea, is they are making a mockery of justice. They don't understand that. You can't do that. You cannot make a mockery of justice, but it's not only a little courtroom. Everybody on the planet, basically, that's tuned in to the internet or whatever, knows, and they're laughing. This is done in Russia, you know, in, in third world banana republics, dictatorships, and so on. How could this be done in America when you have a constitution, a bill of rights, and so on? So they have made a mockery of justice, which itself will condemn them to death, just like it did Saddam and the Mabel, you see? But more important, they made a mockery before the entire world, demonstrating that we can all have a good laugh at what happened to Donald Trump. But they're not playing around with Trump. They're playing around with God, because he will not tolerate that abuse of society. So therefore, I'm, I'm just saying this is a conjecture on my part. Neither the judge or the DA, okay, or any of these people involved in this mockery have no idea of what retribution they will suffer because of what they did to the justice of God. You see, and again, I mention this because of what happened just recently in terms of retribution and so on, you see. So it's a very important concept, you know. You know, you want to play around with God, you're taking a big chance. 
but eventually it will come back to haunt you and when it does then the Russian will utterly destroy you you see and what's also very bad you know is that really he's been denied constitutional rights and so on so they don't realize that it's not that only the judge and the, 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 the DA the woman DA and so on and so forth it's New York City by allowing this to take place by allowing a travesty of this nature and therefore making a, like I say a mockery of justice you know by, by New York allowing this in other words the governor or there's somebody on top of this judge he's not the only judge there's a, he's got a supervisor and they, they could they, they could put an end to it or somebody's got to come up and say and stand for justice you see and what they did is, is, is like I say is they denied him clear law and they fabricated a law which of course they're twisting and turning and so on and if New York is silent the governor especially the governor because she has the power right she and whatever the mayor whatever they have no idea of what's going to happen to them because they have to protest you can't allow this to happen for the cause and the sake of justice itself this is forbidden anyway so I wanted to mention that because that is uh, in a certain way one of the reasons why I want to talk about the retribution at the end of time and we see the mockery of justice you see and that in many ways we are very close to the end of time now there are several things I want to mention and so on in terms of you know justice and so on you know <clears throat> you have to understand the Rebbe made a decision at the end, at the beginning of creation what's called Mida Keneged Mida or Mida Sadin the attribute of justice which we know what does that mean is that <clears throat> justice is what is justice okay that whatever you caused you must bear a consequence there's no such thing as causing something and you are exempt from a consequence that's justice now God can suspend justice in the sense that he says I'll wait because justice what does justice say justice say that it has to be met measure for measure immediately but there's a thing called rachamim mercy or compassion right where God says I will suspend the justice hopefully you will you know do tshuva repent and so on but in the end justice has to be served very important concept you see uh, you know and therefore what is justice really justice is justice for the righteous and justice for the wicked and so on whatever you do you must suffer or experience a consequence if you did good you must receive good as a compensation if you did evil then you must receive right some type of retribution again as a as a uh, a uh, compensation that's all justice is you must receive consequences for your acts you see which in many ways like I said is very important and therefore that's the first idea is there must be consequences the second idea which is part of that and I'm going into the concept itself right is what is the consequence that you have to receive basically the consequence is is that you have to undo that which you caused which is interesting in other words if you cause an evil then you must undo the evil it's almost like gravity you jump off the roof guess what gravity's not going to argue with you you know it's not going to present why it shouldn't work you go straight down and that's the end of it it's an absolute uh, uh, law that happens automatically same thing we don't realize that we are empowered to do things because we have free will free will simply means right is that whatever I decide I actually can do 
Not only that, uh, the decision that I make is placed there, not by God, but in some way I have come to that idea. You see, God does not put the decision to what to do at all, and therefore that's free will. Everything else is, in a certain sense, preordained, which means if you don't have free will on that moment and whatever, then you didn't come up with the idea, so you're not held guilty. But in whatever area, and it's only in certain areas, you have free will, right, that you caused that decision to exist. You see, and then you went through with it and so on, you see. So therefore, what justice says is that you therefore have to undo the cause of what you caused. That's really what it is. And that's, that's why it's meter connected meter, measure for measure. If you did A, then you must have not B. You must, you must receive the opposite of A, and that undoes A. So that's a very important idea. What exactly is justice? It's the concept of undoing that which you actually caused because of your free will. Uh, the second thing I want to mention, which I had mentioned in the past, but people don't understand what this means. How far does justice go? People don't realize in any given event there will be consequences, you see. But consequences itself has a certain distance from what you did, you see. So therefore, there are different like I said, distances to whatever the consequences are. And if you, so for instance, let's assume somebody does something, right? And because of what he did, somebody else learned from him, right? Let's say somebody wrote a novel, a book, you know, that praises bank robbery or whatever, right? Fine. So the consequence of what he did is he disseminated evil. Then let's assume somebody reads that novel, right? And he says, hey, this guy has a point. And he now goes out and commits also, let's say whatever it is, a bank robbery. Or let's assume now that this novel that he wrote now hits the New York Times bestseller right book. And now you have, what, you know, 10,000 people that read his book and now they go out and do. So the question is, wait a minute, is he guilty of what they did? Or is he just guilty about what he did? And the answer is, justice demands that any consequence, no matter how far and no matter how remote it is from you, if you can be linked to the chain of causality of these 10,000 people, you suffer based on or in ratio of how far they are distant from your acts. People don't realize that. Uh, so it comes out that a guy, the worst thing is to get on the internet, right? And all of a sudden, a million people watch your stuff. And if you're promoting evil, defilement, injustice, tumor, lush and horror, right? And you have a million people that see it. And as a result of that, so not only is the consequence that they are seeing what you have to say, but let's assume they try to replicate your behavior in some way, or they, get in, they gain encouragement. You don't realize you will suffer, then justice says, wait a minute, this guy caused a million people in some way, right, to violate the laws of what's proper, the laws of the Torah. Therefore, this guy will suffer, because that's justice. You caused a million people at some level, right, to violate what is proper or moral or terror and so on. Therefore, you must undo the million people. You have any idea what that means? That's why the internet is most, one, probably the most dangerous invention ever made in terms of what it's going to do for you. You see? So if you do, if, you know, you gotta be crazy to get on the internet and talk Lush and horror. You know, it used to be, you talk Lush and horror, so there was one guy you told it to and that was the end of it, which was bad enough because he may have done something 
and talked about Lashonara to somebody else and that somebody else spread it to somebody else. Okay, okay so it's a chain of events that you cause or initiate and so on. But if you get on the internet, right, you don't even know how many people are listening to this stuff. And you will be responsible for every person that will do a sin. You have any idea what you carry, what your burden is? And the law of din is that you are responsible to undo everybody's act. I mean, if people realize that, would they then use the internet to disseminate evil? It's incredible. And people do not realize that, and so on, you know, <clears throat> and so on. For instance, I'll give you an example, <clears throat> you know. You go out, right, and you're a politician, and you are now talking for abortion. You're saying abortion, I mean, think about this. Biden, he's all for abortion at any time. Does he understand that if he does that and 10 million people watch him, right? And they say, yeah, he's right. Abortion's good. But abortion basically after 40 days is murder. That's therefore every person that will kill their kid, right? That makes him a murderer for every person that killed their kid. But it's not only that, you know. This kid could have had a life, right? We don't even know what that life is. Where maybe he would have done a hundred million mitzvahs. So the fact that there's no hundred million mitzvahs done is added to what he did because he destroyed the potential of that human being. We don't even know what that is. It takes God to know the truth of the damage that he do does. You know, so it's incredible. Or for instance, what's happening in the southern border, right? Fentanyl is coming over that border. We cannot imagine how much fentanyl is coming over that border by the cartels. But it kills, people estimate, let's say 130,000 people every year. And most of them, I think, are teenagers. Now imagine, you know, the teenager dies, okay, but wait a minute, what about his whole life, what he could have been? But you're not only a murderer for this kid, right? You're a murderer for, for every good thing he could have done, you see? And what about his parents, that you've caused them untold grief, that they have to bury their teenage son, you see? And the whole family that is mourning this child, how many avlays, how many injustices or tragedies have you caused by one death? So imagine if you are the President of the United States, right, and 130,000 American citizens which you are obligated, right, to protect. It's a basic uh, right, uh, you know, the uh, obligation of the President to observe the law and the safety of the United States citizens and so on. Can you imagine what this man is going to be guilty of? He has no concept, you know. I mean, it's something like that to undo what he did. All the <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people over the years, you know, of, of people coming in and all the drugs and so on. Does he have any idea what the retribution will be? It's astounding. He doesn't. I'm, I'm not even going into his motives. What I'm trying to do is tell you Din is a very serious affair, and it's very dangerous. And we don't do that. Now, it's true that, you know, the judge judgments, but we, we're, not, we're not able to see the full consequences of everything that we do. That's true. We're not able to see that. But at least be aware that at least what you want to do, you want to try to minimize its effect, because justice is going to demand, right, that the consequences of what you did, no matter how far remote, even if somebody, right, in is a hundred years from now will read your book and decide to commit evil, guess what? You're going to be punished for that guy who lived a hundred years later for what you did. That is why, by the way, there are three judgment periods. One is every Rosh Hashanah. 
to determine whether you'll live or die. The second is after you die, right? There's a judgment to determine, you know, do you have to come back or do you get Canadian or whatever and so on. But then there's a great judgment day. Why? Because God looks at every effect, consequence of your behavior throughout all time. You have any idea what that means? And all of that is going to be stacked in front of you and say, well, justice demands that you have to undo all of this. And you're going to look at that pile and you're going to have a heart attack. Well, you can't have a heart attack because you're already dead. But, uh, you know, people don't realize what the Day of Judgment is. It is undoubtedly the most frightening time in the history of mankind. Is the Judgment Day at the end of the, by, by the redemption. You have no concept. So, therefore, when we talk about re, uh, retribution, right, this is all part of the concept of retribution, in any case. So that is very important to know, you see. Mm. Now, mm. there are certain things that are happening which are, as far as I'm concerned, very, very uh, Im important to know and so on, you see that there will be a retribution. Just like Egypt, there was a retribution. So that will happen, you see. Okay, that's a very important idea. That we're not talking about retribution in the future world or Gehenna or whatever. We are talking about retribution in this planet. And you will see that from Chazal, you know, where God, if you learn the Navi, how many Yeshayohu, right? Or Yemiyohu, Yecheske, whatever, Treyasa and so on, you know, the books of Vim. You know how many times it talks about what God is going to do to the Goyim? Where, where there's one person that says, I will make a call of a Goyim. I'm going to make an end to the Goyim. But to the Jews, I will not. Because what the God does with the Jews is they suffer the consequences over the Golas. And by the way, that is why the Golas is so long. Because God does not want to give the Jews the the consequences in Gehenna. So what he's chosen to do is give them Golas. And Golas is really, right, what he does in order for them to undo whatever bad they've done, you see. And that is why it's called the Arichas Golas. That is why Golas is 2,000 years in order to undo the consequences while they're here, you see. And many places in the Novi it speaks about the retribution of God and he's not talking about the retribution of God you know uh, in the next world he's talking about the retribution of God here in this world especially at the end of time you see <clears throat> now I know in a certain sense it's uncomfortable to hear but you have to hear it because this is the reality and in a certain way maybe it will influence, influence your behavior you see, <clears throat> well, we already begin to see, you know, the retribution. And I'd like to point out certain ideas. It's already beginning. The concept of retribution. And I would like to point out things which I feel is really the retribution, but it's going slow. Okay. The United States is already suffering terribly. Let me give you an example. We have a situation in New York City, in New York State, in many other cities across the United States. It's called the migrants. The question is, how do we understand the migrant invasion based on the concept of retribution at the end? And I'll tell you, it's something interesting. You know, it's my thinking. But let me tell you, you know, what are the migrants? The migrants are people who come in illegally, <coughs> obviously with the blessings of the government, right? But they're really another state. It's another country. Well, that's measure for measure. You want Israel to be a two-state solution? You want to take Israel and put the Arabs and give them an official state next to the Jewish people, which obviously means their destruction. So therefore, guess what? I will give you also a two-state solution. Migrants. You're going to have peoples f 
right now there's they say seven million migrants that have come into the United States. And by the way, seven million is more than 35, the population of 35 different states. That's how much seven million is, you know. So you want to create this terrible existential threat to Israel by two-state solution? You know, measure for measure. I will give you two states, right? They're called migrants, right? There's actually two populations in many cities across the land, and they're destroying the United States. You see, that's exactly what they're doing. And that's a two-state solution. We need to solve the problem of people coming in, migrants from other countries. You know, they're all claiming asylum, whether it's true or not, whatever. <laughs> but think about that. That's an incredible concept of measure for measure, is the migrant situation, you see? which is compensation or retribution for the two-state solution, you see, which is really, when you think about it, fascinating. Second idea, right? Biden. Now, I, you know, I, I, he, he, Biden is a very difficult topic to talk about <coughs> because the progressives don't think of Biden. They love Biden, and there's no way you can convince them to see that he's probably, according to some people, the second most worst president in U.S. history. I mean, there's no question in terms of he caused the inflation, right? Uh, I think the inflation that Trump was like 1.3, and now it was up to 10, 11, even if it's down and so on. People cannot afford, they say 60 to 70 percent of people cannot afford to live. They live from paycheck to paycheck, and even then they don't make it. Could you imagine 60 to 70 percent of a population cannot survive because the incredible cost anybody just go to the grocery store and you'll see uh, obviously what i mean then we'll talk about the the uh, invasion at the border it's destroying and i'm not even and then you talk about the fentanyl not only that are you aware how much human trafficking there is going on at the border they say human trafficking sex trafficking I'm not, I'm not even familiar with all that but all that is taking place at the border you see so then there's the crime I mean, you in new york city cops get beat up I mean, you ever hear anything like this right and this is true there's a tremendous rise in crime all over the united states whoever heard of this before you see <clears throat> and not only that the bunsham says you know you want to make yourself as they say in yiddish you want to make believe, avoid all this, and you don't want to know what's going on in your country, President Biden. Okay, guess what? I will take away your DAS. Right. You, want, you don't want to know. You want to remove your consciousness from that which you are obligated to do. Fine. Measure for measure. I will take away the ability to have DAS, to have consciousness, to have knowledge. That's why that guy doesn't know what he's doing anymore. It's a punishment because he's being humiliated in front of the entire world. We're not looking at a guy who is senile, unfortunately, which is a tragedy, right? We're looking at the senility of the most powerful man on earth. And everybody sees it. Do you have any idea what the embarrassment is and the humiliation where whoever he meets with sees this guy can't put two sentences together? And he does this in front of people, millions of people who listen to him. I mean, it's, it's astounding that his, his, uh, his ability to think, right, is, is, is demonstrated in front of the entire world. This guy's senile. He doesn't know what he's doing. Why? Now, ultimately speaking, I'm not God. I don't know the real reason why. Obviously, there are very profound reasons. But I can't tell you something which I see, obviously. God says, measure for measure, you want to avoid seeing what you're doing and you don't care. You're right. I will take away your ability to see. And therefore, he becomes senile. But the terrible thing that he suffers through, right, is that... He's a laughing stock to half America, or the whole world, actually. Right, that's right. Senility, in his case, I'm not saying in everybody's case, you know. 
There's a reason why God removes his ability to think, his memory, right? His ability to reason and make judgments and so on. Because he's done that for years, you see, uh, and, and so on. So that's an interesting concept, what's an interesting idea, you see. And God has just done now. He doesn't realize he's getting punished more and more. This is the retribution, right? This is the retribution before the end. You see, he doesn't understand that, uh, you see. And, and that is, in many ways, what the punishment is, which when you think about it, is just incredible. So we have two understandings so far. The migrant situation, which is a measure for measure for the two-state solution that they, everybody knows will destroy Eretz Israel, the state of Israel. Obviously, we all know what Hamas is going to do, and Hezbollah, and the Houthis, and Iran, right? And even the West Bank, and the people in Syria and Iraq, the, uh, and so on, you know? But nobody cares. So therefore, God initiates that. And like I say, he's destroying Biden. And that's why, ultimately, I believe <clears throat> that the true retribution, who's destroyed America like this? We know. Who introduced, in many ways, the permission of the LGBTQ to corrupt the morals of America, and in, on, in many ways to corrupt the morals of the world, right, which we know, according to the Torah, is forbidden, the Democratic Party, the progressives, the liberals, right? So it's interesting to watch. They're trying to destroy Trump. Who is really trying to destroy Trump, which is interesting? You have to realize something. It's the Sutton who's desperate to destroy Trump because Trump is the Toyf Shabaisov. When he gets, becomes president, he will destroy the Democratic Party. So in many ways, you're looking at retribution of the Democratic Party, of the progressive, for the incredible corruption and evil that they have done. I mean, just take a look at America. It, in many ways, it's an Alice in Wonderland scenario. That's what it's become, you see. So they will be destroyed. So imagine the cities of America are being destroyed with the migrants. The president is being destroyed, right? Every day he's more and more senile. I don't know if you know it, but Biden doesn't work anymore as president. They say he works maybe two days a week, and five days a week he has nothing on his calendar. Nothing. And there's so many problems in America. He doesn't, all he does is take vacations. He's the most, he's a president that has taken the most vacations in the history of, the, of, of America. It's just beyond belief. This is the president of the United States. You know, it's really a vacation, you know, uh, and so on. And right now he's not functioning as a president at all. And we don't realize that because who's got time to go check up on his daily schedule, uh, you see? But if you check up on the schedule, you realize that there are many days in the week that go by. He has nothing on his calendar. Nothing. So what does he do? Sleeps. Eats. There's nothing. And we're talking about a country like America that has a zillion problems going on. You see? <clears throat> he's out of it. You see? And that's an oinish for what he's doing. And so on. <clears throat> in any case... Now, what is interesting is, and this I'm afraid of, there are two things that are happening as a retribution. One of them is what's happening to America, which I'm talking about now, the cities, Biden, the migrants, uh, and, and so on. And America is being punished because they have gone along with the destruction of morality, LGBTQ. So God is destroying with extreme weather and so on. He's destroying, and the inflation. The inflation is a tremendous punishment to America. It's part of the retribution. Uh, notice they're all coming together at the same time. Because what we're looking at is the beginning of the initiation of the retribution before the Messianic era, right? When the evil will be compensated for what it has done, you see. But what's interesting also, and I'm afraid of this, but I have to say it anyway, 
one of the final acts of retribution, and I'm afraid of this, but I'll say it anyway, and Biden has caused this. You have no idea of how many terrorists are floating around America. Out of seven million people who have come into America, they estimate hundreds of thousands of them, them are terrorists. And they're all, in many ways, each one in his own way, planning to do another 9-11. Another you have any what the idea what that means? Why? Because that's the retribution. God says, you are stopping Israel from destroying Hamas, Hezbollah, right? Iran. Not only that, what kind of a business is this? Israel is an ally. So how could you fund a country, Iran, that not only will become nuclear and then they'll threaten the entire world, right? But these, they are a mortal enemy to the Jewish people. But wait a minute, these are your allies. How could you fund Iran? You see, <coughs> you are actually aiding and abetting and giving existence and success to terrorism. Everybody knows what Iran is, yet you don't care. And we're not looking at a cause. It's bad enough that Iran is creating havoc in the Middle East. It's bad enough, you know. But what you're doing is you are creating, aiding and abetting, an existential threat to Israel. You see, if not for God, in many ways, Israel will not survive. Why? Because Israel cannot fight a war on five fronts. That's really what you're looking at. Iran is one front, Houthis are two, Hezbollah is three, Hamas is four, and the uh, West Bank is five. And then you have the Syrian and the Iraqis, right? that are trying to take out Israel, six fronts. And the, the worst of the enemies is not Hamas or Houthis or whatever, it is Iran, which is a sophisticated country, right, with real missiles and so on, and Hezbollah. It's incredible. And they could take out Israel. All they need is one well-placed bomb in the middle of Tel Aviv. All you need is a small hydrogen bomb. That's the end of Israel. Now, even if they have the Iron Dome, so what? I mean, how many Iron Domes do they have? Hezbollah has 150,000 missiles. At least one-third of them is precision-guided. You can't stop that. You see? So, we're looking at a true existential threat. And these guys, Blinken and, and Biden, they are incredible betrayers. They are betrayers. They, they, it's, tre it's treachery on one side to give, it's nice that they give ammunition, with, and of course they make that conditional, obviously, and so on. They're stopping Israel from destroying Hamas. They're saying Israel cannot go into Rafa. What do you mean it can't go into Rafa? Hamas has said that they are going to repeat October 7th over and over again, right? So how could you not let them destroy uh, Rafa? Are, are you crazy, you guys? You see? It's unbelievable what's happening. And that's one way to destroy Israel, is by preventing them from finishing them off, you see? And the second thing is not just Hamas, you know what I'm saying? But how do you support Iran? How do you give them money? Eight billion dollars, 80, you don't, you don't uh, fulfill the sanctions. So right now they're worth 70 to 80 billion dollars. Under Trump they only had four billion dollars in reserve, and now they have 80. And that's because of Obama? and Biden. Uh, you're looking at an unbelievable act of treachery in all these ways, in terms of stopping Israel from finishing them off, and in terms of what they're doing to Iran. Uh, you see, so I'm afraid that what God may do, and this is measure for measure, you want to destroy my country, my people, right? But it's not only that, your ally you know, even if they were not my people, right? And my, my you know, uh, my chosen people and so on and so forth, right? They're your ally. What's the logic? It's a slam dunk accusation. So God is going to say, okay, you want to destroy Israel? Guess what? I'm going to give major success to a whole bunch of terrorists that you've let in to do another 9-11. You have any idea what's going to happen to America if that happens? 
If you have a 9-11 in some city somewhere in the United States, or maybe two or three, because they're working together, right? You have any idea what that means for America? You see? And that's what's interesting about that, is that all of a sudden the Americans, right, will wake up and realize what they've done is terrible, right? And they will destroy Iran. Yeah, it's one of the ways to get America to turn against Iran, because they now realize what they have done to themselves, right? And they will rid Iran of its ability to do anything, right? That would be very interesting, how God got America finally to enter the war, right? What are we looking at? It's another Pearl Harbor. How did God get America to get into the war, World War II, to save the Jewish people? Because that's really what God did it for. He wanted America to go in and save, save the Jewish people from the Holocaust, which of course, ultimately, that's what brought around the end, right? He did Pearl Harbor, right? What is Pearl Harbor? Think about that. Pearl Harbor was insane. Why would the Japanese do this? They should have consolidated their power in the Pacific and then do something to America. But they didn't do that. They decided to bomb America. Are they crazy? In fact, the famous uh, Yamamoto, I think he was the head of the Navy, whatever, where he said a famous statement when they decided to bomb Pearl Harbor. So he said, you know, he basically said, are you guys crazy? I only fear, this is a quote, I only fear that we have awakened a sleeping giant, America, and filled it with a terrible resolve. <laughs> and believe me, you don't want to do that. Uh, but they did it anyway. Why? Because God said, I'm bringing you into the Holocaust because <clears throat> I need you to stop Germany, right? <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? And that's a mess. How stupid could the Japanese be to attack America? What they think is going to happen? <clears throat> you see, <clears throat> because it's not them. God takes away their free will. Why would a guy like Osama bin Laden, why would he do that to the World Trade Center? Is he stupid? You're not ready to take on America. Of course not. So America ultimately killed him and everybody else in Al-Qaeda, although now they're coming back. But it's, it's all because of, uh, you know, that God decided, hey, listen, I got to take you guys out, and so on, <clears throat> you see? God arranges this. So I'm afraid, again, now, God forbid it should happen, but I could see it within the laws of measure for measure. God is saying, you want to destroy my people, right? Which is even worse. Or you want to destroy the chosen people that have given you civilization, right? Uh, but wait a minute, they're your ally. How do you do this to your ally? Are you crazy? Guess what? You want to destroy them? There we are, measure for measure. I will allow the Arabs to destroy you. And all of a sudden, there's another 9-11. Because if God doesn't want another 9-11, it won't happen. You don't realize something. Nobody can harm one hair on the head of any American unless God decrees that it has to happen. You don't realize that, how many things are in the power of God. Uh, so what stops the Bershom as measure for measure from having that done to America? Now, what's interesting that if it does happen, God forbid, but if it does happen, America will destroy Iran. Isn't that an interesting way that the Muslim can get Iran to destroy it? You see? But that's the concept of retribution. You see? And it's all part of Midas Hadin, measure for measure. You see? <clears throat> and there's another. That's one that has taken place. And America will have caused it by allowing these people to enter the United States. It's Biden's fault. That's what everybody's going to realize. He's the one who caused this. Because all those terrorists are now in the United States, plotting and planning. So everybody knows that, even the FBI said. It's not a matter of if, it's when. This is the FBI. <clears throat> but there's something else which is happening simultaneous. Who has destroyed the Jewish people? In many ways. I will tell you. It's the Erev Rav. Israel, the government of Israel, which is left, progressives, whatever, have destroyed the Jewish people. Why? By denying them their heritage. 
What is the heritage of the Jew? What is the history of the Jew? And the answer, it's Torah. Do you realize a guy can go, I, I pointed this out, as 1.5 million kids in the public school in Israel, they don't know anything in Judaism. So the government is responsible for denying the heritage, the Torah, to the Jewish people. You have an idea what the punishment for that is? I don't even want to contemplate it, uh, you see. So what did God do? So God said, listen, you guys are too busy. W what does the heir of Rav do? Well, they destroy the Torah, basically. They deny the chinuch, the education, to kids. This is the future of Israel. They don't know anything. And look how antagonistic they are against the Haredim that teach Torah. You see? No, you got to join the army. I don't want to go into all the politics, but uh, what the left has done, including the right, is destroyed the religion of the Jewish people. Well, guess what? So I could see this. The IDF, the Mossad, and the Shin Bet has demonstrated one of the greatest failures of intelligence ever seen in a country. I mean, think about that. The Gaza border was the most violent place in Israel. It was the most dangerous place to be. Yet there was nobody there. There was no IDF. And they were warned. They knew about this. They now come out and realize that the IDF, certainly the Mossad, the Shin Bet, right? They knew that they were going to be attacked. So why didn't they respond? They actually, uh, they did nothing for, for hours and hours, you see. So there's going to be a major investigation. And that will reveal something that who even wants to look at in terms of the failure of the military services and the intelligence services. Because you have to remember, there were two failures. The first failure is they failed to, uh, to know a, the security failure or rather the intelligence failure. But they now realize that that's also not true. The IDF knew already that they were planning to do something. But the real failure is the security failure. Will, when the invasion was happening, there were people calling up all over the place. We are being invaded. We are being killed. Come. And they didn't come. The army did not come, which is absolutely incredible. So, I mean, I, mean I, I don't want to conjecture what the idea is and why, but that's going to be one of the greatest uh, travesties in Israeli history. And I believe that may overthrow the entire government in terms of what they did. And hopefully, you know, and I'm hoping that it will place the real, uh, real people that will help Israel, the Jewish people, come back to their Torah. And I already mentioned who. I'm hoping that Jonathan Pollard and Ben Gavir will form a party. And the reaction, the backlash against what these guys did, the left, will be so severe that these guys will be put into place to be the prime minister and so on. But in any case, I'm hoping that will happen. But they're both happening simultaneously. That's what's so interesting. The fall of the Democratic Party. Do you notice Trump? Trump is walking around as if everything's okay. How? I mean, the guy's got to pay $83 million for some type of money to some woman, whatever. Then he just was slapped with $355 million. And with the interest, they say, it comes out to $450 million, right? And he's walking around. I mean, anybody else would have died from a heart attack. Any, anybody. He, it's not normal to look at him and we'll watch him walk around. It's unheard of. And it has to be because the Bansham is saying, don't worry, I will take care of your health. You will survive and you will be the President of the United States because I need you to destroy the evil in your midst. And the evil in your midst is the progressives, the Democratic Party, and certainly to get rid of Biden and so on. And all of this will come back to haunt them. But what's amazing to me is that all of this is being done at the same time. The finalization of the retribution against the era of Rav that has destroyed the religion of the Jewish people, basically, 
by not teaching the youth and by being adversaries to Torah and the Haredim and so on, that's about to happen because what God has created is a major failure on the part, and not only a failure, but it's very possible that there could be a conspiracy. I don't even want to go that way, but that's possible. And I think everybody believes it by now, that they somehow knew and they didn't care, or they had some crazy reasoning, which I believe is criminal. But in any case, and then you're watching the destruction of Biden and the Democratic Party and so on, you know, and that this will, these two forms of retribution are happening simultaneously. I see all of this, you see, I see all of this, the destruction of what? Of the American cities. The inflation of America that's killing the average ability of people, the migrants, the southern border, right? The crime in the streets. Well, you know, it's an amazing thing about it. We're not talking here about people left out, no bail, they just walk the street. I mean, I, 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 I listened and, and I heard a report where, where they got a guy who, I forgot what he did, some crime, but he was, he was charged 50 times. That's how many times they caught him doing it and put, put, put him, and they let him go 50 times. What kind of a justice system is that? Are they crazy? This is what's happening. But you know, the real coup de gras, and I believe, you know, this really said everybody, you know, it's hard to believe what's happening, I'm telling you. It's like Alice in Wonderland and, and so on, you know. But when they beat up the cops in Times Square, you know what it is to beat up a cop? It's not only a mockery of justice, it's a mockery of the whole enforcement system. It's, you know, and then the guy, whoever the guy was, he gave the reporters the finger, whatever that means and so on, you know. It's like he laughs in their face. You don't realize to beat up cops the way they did, I, don't, I didn't see the video, but these guys, Venezuelans, are kicking the guy in the head, which could easily kill the guy, right? I mean, that's attempted murder, and so on, you know. It's beyond belief what it means about the respect of law and order, and so on. And then what happened, the DA, I don't even want to mention the guy's name, he's not worthy of being mentioned, right? He put him out on bail, and now they run away and they're trying to get him back. Is this guy out of his mind? Yeah, and that's who they voted. You know, it's amazing to watch, you know, uh, you know, it's like the Russian has dumbed down America because he gets America to put these people in that destroy them. You know, who put in Hochul? The blacks. Yet Hochul is destroying Harlem. She's destroying New York City and the one who's really getting suffered, suffering is, is the blacks because everybody's running away from the neighborhoods and they, and they have no stores, right? <clears throat> you know, I mean, I mean, compared what Zeldin would have been to Hochul is like night and day and so on, you know? Who put in this guy in Chicago, you know? Who put in all these mayors or DAs that don't want to do justice? It's the Americans. So how crazy can they be? They keep voting for people that are terrible, incompetent, you know, downright dangerous, because if you don't know how to run a city, that's very dangerous. And that's exactly what's happening. So I believe you, what I'm trying to say is that I believe you are looking now at the introduction of the retribution of these people, both in America, as I've illustrated, and also in Eretz Israel. And this has to proceed before the Mashiach comes because it has to duplicate what happened in the Yamsuf, where evil attempts to resurge and they're destroyed. You see, that's the compensation, that's the retribution. I believe that's basically what's happening in America. And there's so much ample evidence and there's so much ample ideas of what's happening. But it's not by accident. All of this is divinely ordained. We have to wake up and realize, you know, uh, so it's very important for us to realize these are not chance events. This is orchestrated by God, you see. And but what you see here is a singular concept. Everything is falling apart. Everything. Everybody realizes this country is falling apart. 
America has changed in the last three years that hasn't changed in the last 200 years. It's astounding what a man can do to a country like America in three years. I want to tell you this, and I want to end with this, okay? If you want to curse a country, or to put it another way, what's the worst thing that can happen to a country? If God wants to destroy a country, what, what, what will he do? I will tell you. Curse the country this way, that you should have a leader that's an egomaniac and thoroughly evil. The greatest evil you can do to a country, right, is to have a leader that's not only incompetent, but corrupt and evil, who's only into himself. And that's the end of the entire country, even though the country has 335 million people, you see. And in many ways, Biden, I hate to say it, is very evil, because he, it's on his watch, and he doesn't care. He knows what's happening in the southern border. He's not that senile. He doesn't care. He, we, he, we do not fail to realize the evil of this man. You see? And it, it's not the senility is coming on him. That's the punishment. Like I said, you don't want to know what's going on. You're right. I'll make sure you don't know because you become senile. Right. You see? So Biden is really, if you think about it and you're honest, is the worst curse America has ever received. Right. Just look what he did in three years. You know? What's the best blessing you can give a country? That they should have a wise, generous, kind, gentle, and honest leader. The greatest blessing of all. And fortunately, God did that with Avraham Avinu where he said to Avraham Avinu, right? V'nivruchu b'cho All the earth will be blessed through you. Kol mishpachisu adama Why? Right? Because you will bring leadership to the world. And that's the greatest blessing of all. Not only because spiritually you're so high, you know, because Avraham Avinu, eh, you know, he's brilliant. <laughs> you know, he knew everything he did was right. Right, the right thing, wisdom. Man was unbelievably brilliant and so on, you know. So that's what God said. The earth will be blessed through you. I'm not even looking at metaphysical explanations. It's just simple. That's the greatest blessing a nation can have, is to have, like I said, this type of leadership. And the worst thing of the nation is to have an evil leader. And America has that right. And unfortunately, it's not that Israel is evil. But based on what the God requires, they are evil. I hate to say it. When you deny kids, and that's the future of the Jewish people, when you deny 1.5 million kids their Torah education, that's evil. Even if they know economics and so on. You know, God has his way of looking at things. And that's what we're in. We are being ruled by evil people in America, you know, and uh, like I say, you know, and the same thing in Eretz Israel. You don't realize, I don't care, you may say, well, they don't really know. No, they do know. What country doesn't teach the heritage or the history of that country to its people? The Arabs, they're all studying the Quran. Do they deny their people their theology of Islam? Of course not. They, 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 what they have there is schools that you memorize the Quran. So how is it possible that Israel doesn't have an understanding of their own Torah, the halachas, the laws of the holidays and so on? How do you do that? How do you deny Klai Israel the bond that they have with God? Right. Terrible evil. And I hate to say this because I don't want to introduce you know, some type of prosecution. But I, I say this only in the sense of trying to correct the situation. Wake up! Realize what's happening. And what seems to be happening, which is what the Shia really is all about, is we are beginning to witness the retribution of the nations of the world right. So the good news is that, well, that's what's supposed to precede the Mashiach. 
the bad news is we're in the middle of this which is very bad and so on you know so let's hope you know that it will end soon and that by this Pesach the Mashiach will come and free us all thank you <laughs>